You're listening to More Than a Song, episode 160. Hello, and welcome to this episode of More Than a Song. My name is Michelle Nizat, and this is the podcast dedicated to helping you discover the truth of Scripture hidden in today's popular Christian music. My goal is to teach you to connect portions of God's Word with the songs you're singing along with on the radio, to help you meditate on truths that will transform your way of thinking and ultimately your life. This week's song by Mercy Me is new and has rocketed up the charts. And I know that songs that resonate get more playtime. But what I love most about Even If is that it resonates, yes, of course, but more importantly, it points us directly to Scripture. And you're going to find pairing your Bible study time this week with this song, you're going to find that it's going to be extremely powerful. And I, I just can't wait any longer. So let's jump right on in. What will I say? I'm held to the flame like I am right now. I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is for you alone. The phrase even if comes straight from a story found in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Now, whenever I'm tackling a book of the Bible that I'm not familiar with or that I haven't studied in a while, I'll use the Bible interaction tool exercise. I call them bites. Uh, These are just exercises that I use to uh, interact with God's word. So I will use the Bible interaction tool exercise of consulting a commentary or a summary introduction. Now, a lot of times they're very short. So if you have a study Bible, you should have these introductions at the beginning of each book of the Bible. So you can read through that. I also like to use the online tool, blueletterbible.org, as a resource for introductions. So through my research, I discovered that in just by reading the introduction, it told me that the first six chapters of Daniel record fantastic stories of God's supernatural rescue of Daniel and his friends. And then the remaining chapters of the book consist of visions and future judgment and deliverance by the Messiah. And some of Daniel's prophetic themes are are yet to be fulfilled, and they're echoed in the book of Revelation. Daniel's a very exciting book. I will go ahead and link to the introduction in my show notes found at michellekneezat.com forward slash 160. So I will link to uh, that introduction at blueletterbible.org there. Now, the next Bible interaction tool exercise is to read in context. If you've been a listener for long, you know it's my favorite my favorite bite. But what I mean by this is that you don't want to take this story out of context. In fact, it, this particular story will you will gain a lot of knowledge by reading the chapters around the story. So, um, you'll increase your understanding of the characters in this story and of the circumstances uh, that lead up to where we are. So, if you back up a couple of chapters and read through your focus area of scripture, you'll always get a better idea of the background of the story and even the purpose of the author. So in this case, we're going to be in Daniel chapter three today. So we're going to read chapters one and two to get a clear picture of the main characters highlighted in the story in chapter three. So I don't have time today to read all of Daniel chapter one and two to you. So, uh, but I do want to give kind of some perspective. So I, w- I will briefly highlight those chapters. But this is a perfect time for you to pull out your Bible this week and read through Daniel chapter 1 and 2 and lead into this uh, story in Daniel chapter 3. That's going to be our focus for today. So Daniel and three of his friends are swept up in in Nebuchadnezzar's raid and conquering of Jerusalem in approximately 605 BC. Now, these boys at the time, Daniel and his friends, they are of noble birth, and they meet the standards set by the king. And the standards are these. They needed to be young and strong and healthy and good-looking and able to learn. 
So early on in their captivity, all four of these these uh, boys that eventually grew up to be men resolved to stay faithful to God. Now for them, this was a relationship. This was not a religion that was easily cast aside when the going got tough or when they were thrust into a new culture. They proved their faithfulness to God in chapter one, and then God miraculously used them in chapter two, ultimately giving them high positions within the Babylonian kingdom. Now, some of the commentary I read this week indicated that it could be as many as 20 years later when the events of chapter 3 happen. So this brings up the importance of historical context, which is another bite I like to use. Truly understanding elements such as culture and the time when the book was written and even an estimation of the dates of events can really shed light on the dialogue and on the details of the account that we're going to read in chapter 3. So let's assume that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these are their Babylonian names, by the way, they have been, uh, again, let's assume that they have been ruling authorities in Babylon for 20 years. So how do I know that they have this position? Well, because of the context that chapter 2 gives us, it says in verse 49, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon, while Daniel remained in the king's court. So, in Jan- in chapter 3, we don't see Daniel at all, and there's no indication in scripture where he might be, but we have to assume that he's not in the area at the time of this story. Because if he would have been, he would have been right there with his friends, once again standing up for God when the temptation would have been to give in to the pressure of the culture around them. So chapter 3 opens with King Nebuchadnezzar setting up an enormous statue of gold of himself. And he requires that everyone in the kingdom bow in worship to it. Now, when I say enormous, I mean enormous, like 90 feet high and nine feet wide. So obviously, uh, just being nine feet wide, it's not going to be humanly proportional, but it's big, okay? Now, we see the music play and the people bow in worship. And many people bowed, I would assume, because it was the cultural thing to do. And perhaps there were some that actually even worshipped Nebuchadnezzar and his power, But just in case they wouldn't worship out of sincerity of heart, King Nebi put another condition on the event. He said that anyone who refused to bow would be thrown into a fiery furnace. So whether the people really worshipped the idol or were just trying to avoid the devastating consequence of not bowing down, scripture tells us what happens next. In verse 7 of chapter 3, it says, So at the sound of the musical instruments, All the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, then the story gets interesting. Again, assuming that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been leading this province for a significant period of time. You know, this was a long career at this point. We know that God had given them favor at the beginning of their time in Babylon And so I don't think it's much of a leap to assume that they continued on that path over time. So let me just jump back for a second. Here's how they began. If I go back to Daniel chapter one, it says God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. And when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of the staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which, by the way, were their... um, uh, where there is is uh, Hebrew names. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. So here we have some men who were capable and wise. It's no wonder then that they had some folks out there that weren't fans. 
And I know it shouldn't be like this. When you're capable and wise, you should continue to have favor with God and men, right? Well, not so much with a particular group of folks who seem to have been just waiting for them to slip up so that they could tattle on them to the king. So in Daniel chapter three, we're back in chapter three, verse eight, it says, but some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews because by the way, they did not bow down when the music played. And this is what those little tattletales said. They said, but there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you've put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They re- refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Now, we could unpack this and how they appealed to the king's pride before stating the facts. But either way, it worked because the king was hopping mad. It says, then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Now, their very lives were on the line at this point. They could have complained that they had faithfully served in these roles for 20 years. They could have brought up case after case of when their wisdom served the king well. But they didn't focus in on themselves or their circumstance. This is what they honed in on. They honed in on the claim that God could not rescue them. Here's their response in verse 16 of chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty, but even if he doesn't, We want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Now, I don't know what your even if situation is. It may be as hot as a fiery furnace, but the thing we can learn from these three friends is that they had their eyes fixed on the right thing. You know, I asked myself, Given similar circumstances, what would I be focused on? You know, when I come home at the end of the day and my husband asks, so how'd your day go? Do I say, the king had the nerve to claim that God could not rescue me? (laughs) If I'm honest, probably not. I'm probably hopping mad at the astrologers. I'm railing against their leadership style. I'm claiming I knew all along that they had it out for me and they finally took their chance. I'm I'm feeling totally justified in my anger that the king didn't even think about the 20 years of service I put in. I'm pointing out how qualified I am over those who want my job. I may even be complaining that Daniel wasn't there. But that is not what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They, in fact, they say what I wish I could say more often, which is I do not need to defend myself before you. You know, we don't have to defend ourselves. And you know who else we don't have to defend? We don't have to defend God. I often feel like I have to defend God, somehow believing that he needs to be properly perceived by others at all times, you know, smoothing things over in their mind about who he is and what he can do. They said it, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He is able. He is able. I've been praying with a friend this week who knows he is able and wondering why He isn't rescuing. You know, and it's in these kinds of situations where it's it's just that kind of situation where I feel like I have to defend God. But if my eye is on the right thing, I can see the enemy asking what King Nebuchadnezzar asked. Then what God can save you? You know, casting doubt on the character and power of God. Same play, same playbook that the enemy has had since the beginning, since the Garden of Eden. 
Recognize the play, my friend. Recognize the play and call the enemy out on it. Declare right now. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. He is able. He will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, even if. Even if God doesn't rescue us in the manner we are thinking, we must remain faithful. And I do want to point out that this was a decision they made long ago and they continued to make it. You see, they were going to faithfully follow the Lord. They were going to honor him. They were going to trust him. They were going to put their hope in him. They weren't going to decide in the midst of each circumstance what they were going to do. They didn't decide that day that they weren't going to bow to the gods of this region. They decided long before that day. And so the threat of death did not sway them. Even if God doesn't rescue us in the manner we're thinking, we must remain faithful. So what's next? Well, read Daniel chapter 3 in context, meaning start in chapter 1 and read all the way through chapter 3. You can even keep reading if you get inspired and do so. Consider the historical context of this story. You know, perhaps even research further on the historical details uh, that maybe I didn't even bring up today. Ask yourself how you would respond in this situation. And then decide today that you will remain faithful even if God doesn't choose to rescue you in the manner you desire. And then while you're in God's word this week, let me know how you're doing. Email me, michelle at michellekneezat.com. Hop on Twitter, um, at Michelle Nizat, or Facebook. My public page is Michelle L. Nizat. Let's talk about what you're learning. And before I tell you what song will be featured next week, I want to shout out to Rebecca from Tennessee, Lori from Florida, Kelly from Ohio, Sue from the UK. All of these are my newest subscribers to my website. Welcome. Uh, The benefit of subscribing is that I will email you once a week, and in that email, you get a weekly memory verse resource. You can display that on your smartphone, your tablet, your desktop, or you can even print it out and put it wherever is most convenient for you. You get an email recap of the week's episode, and you will get instant access to any of the resources that I create from my episodes from time to time. And all of that is just my way of saying thank you listening. So head over to michellekneezat.com to subscribe today. And then don't miss an episode of my podcast by subscribing in iTunes. And while you're there, if you wouldn't mind, would you please leave me a written review and a star rating? This not only encourages me, but it helps me stay visible to new listeners. And as always, if you take the time to review my podcast, I will take the time to personally thank you right here on the podcast. Well, that's it for this episode of More Than a Song. Next week, I will use the song More Than Conquerors by Stephen Curtis Chapman. If you liked this episode, would you mind sharing it with others? I've made it really easy. With just one click, you can share via Facebook, Twitter, or email. Just head over to michellekneezat.com forward slash 160. And while you're there, I'd love to hear from you. Click on comment to join the conversation. Until next time, take time to meditate on God's word and consider his ways.